Good evening, everyone. I'm pleasantly surprised. This is a packed house. I'm also pleasantly nervous. But um, I wasn't anticipating this many people in the back, and I don't have a microphone, so if you can't hear me, just go like this, and I'll speak up. Okay? <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, we are here this evening, all of us, um, for, to talk about the Cascade Bridge. To not only talk about the Cascade Bridge, but talk about the crossing of that particular area off Main Street. Um, I'm going to, this, this, the meeting tonight, if you notice the title on here, is a public listening session you get that okay all right so we are we are here to listen we are here to hear your comments we are here to field questions that we can provide objective factual responses to um, but most of all we're here to listen to get a pulse of what this community wants to do moving forward with this particular crossing and structure. So with that, I'm going to introduce, assuming I can get this to work. Um, tonight with me, I have Rachel from Impact 7G. By the way, I'm Mike Fisher from Impact 7G. Um, I am the project manager on this particular effort with the city of Burlington. I also have Brandon over here to the left. Brandon is our cultural resource manager at Impact 7G. He specializes in not only historic structures, but is an archeologist and has done uh, years of archeology, span 15 it looks like. Um, Rachel is an environmental specialist, has done environmental impact analysis, um, a lot of uh, varied environmental work across the board um, and as well as public engagement so they're going to assist us tonight to, to make sure we understand and hear what you have to say with respect to Cascade Bridge so I've got an agenda up here but I'm sure none of you in the back can read it even on that screen there so I'm going <laughs> to so we, have, we do have two screens, so feel free to look at the one um, in, in the back as well. But the general meeting format tonight, let's talk about that. And the general meeting format is we are, everyone came in, they should have signed in. If you didn't sign in, please sign in. You should have been given a comment card. That comment card is only necessary if you don't intend to provide or, or voice a comment during our comment period. If you want us to read a comment out loud to the audience and you don't want to voice it, fill out the card. Rachel will, will be picking those up. And then we're going to talk, uh, verbalize your question or comment on the card. Um, the, after we do the presentation, which should take about 20, 25 minutes, hopefully, and we are running 15 minutes, behind, 10 minutes behind schedule right now. Um, we will be doing a open comment period of which we'll talk about those comment cards. After that comment period, we will be passing out a hard copy paper survey. Many of you may not have seen a hard copy paper survey, but it is a still an effective tool to collect information. So, I want to mention also that that survey will give you about, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes to fill it out if you have an interest in filling it out. It is going to provide us a little bit more specifics with respect to your perspective on this particular topic. In addition to that survey form, there is a website. Um, we did have a card up here with that website on it. That website has a specific input page that allows you to comment. Those, those comments or questions come directly to me, to my computer. Uh, I will respond, letting you know that I received it. 
and those are being cataloged for the purpose of, of understanding the general community consensus regarding the path forward with respect to Cascade Bridge. So please, fill out the survey form if you're inclined to do so, and if not, there is a much shorter input form on the website for those that don't want to fill out a hard copy paper form. So there are a few more seats over here for those who want them. There's another seat up here as well. So um, let's talk. Let me let me mention one thing too. I, I've got a I've got an interesting graphic up here. Um, what that graphic is showing up next to the agenda list is a depiction of the Great River Road. Was everyone aware that this bridge at one time was on the Great River Road? Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure you are. <laughs> it is not now. <laughs> the Great River Road bypasses the bridge. The Great River Road currently, if you're heading from the south, runs up, if you can see my red pointer, runs up to the west of the parks on Harrison takes a ride on Madison? No, that's Harrison. Oh. Harrison. Harrison. Madison. Madison. That's Madison. Madison. Yeah. Madison, then Harrison. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Can and then, and then heads up north toward downtown. It is actually a slightly shorter route than the former route that took you through Crapo Park. Not much. Not, not, not much. <laughs> so, um, so, so I just want to make sure, make you aware of that. That graphic is on the website as well. What we've tried to do with that website is put whatever information is available with respect to this bridge, past studies, resources, National Register of Historic Places nomination. We were fortunate even to get um, a paper that talked about construction of the bridge. That is on that website. Um, we, we are happy if anyone has other relevant information that they would like to see with respect to the bridge, I'm always happy to amend that website and put as much information that you can get your hands on as possible. What this study is about, well, we'll get to that here, let's talk, about, let's talk about project objectives, okay? I'm going to clarify one thing first, hold on, just a second. So what this study is about I'm going to tell you, so there's been a lot of information in the press. No offense to you press guys up here. So, but there's been a lot of information in the press, and I want to clarify a couple things, okay, that I'm seeing in the press that I'm not saying, that may not be quite accurate. Um, first of all, the company that I'm with, Impact 7G, we are a professional environmental services firm. We are not an engineering firm. We provide professional environmental services. We focus on community redevelopment. Some of you may know me from previous work in Burlington. I worked extensively on the downtown area-wide plan related to Brownfields redevelopment. I've also been working heavily on contaminated sites in the Burlington area for the purpose of redeveloping the downtown and expanding economic activity in downtown. Impact 7G is an environmental services firm, so I wanted to clarify that. Um, we will not be providing engineering reports. We're not engineers. We're not going to be providing engineering reports. We will provide guidance and information to the council based on what you tell us in this study and what we're hearing and the facts that we're seeing with respect to the bridge, um, as well as providing guidance to city staff and council on the future process of rehabilitating the bridge, the future process of removing the bridge, the future process of building a new bridge, if any of those alternatives come into play down the road. So we are, our firm also specializes in National Environmental Policy Act work related to federal funding that comes in for projects like this. So that NEPA is essentially environmental impact assessment. It's a procedural process that allows you to utilize federal funds. Um, we also um, specialize in cultural resource, what we call Section 4F analysis. That will also come into play because this bridge, if you have federal funding, will be regulated under Section 4F of the DOT Act of 1966. 
So um, we have people on staff for that. So I wanted to clarify that we're not here, we're not here as an engineering firm. We're not here to reevaluate that structure again. We are here to engage the public and to assist in managing the process, whatever that process is going forward, should there be federal involvement. And when I say federal involvement, it means outside funding that comes in to assist with rehabilitation or reconstruction or new construction. And we'll talk about some of those alternatives as, as we move forward. Um, there was press that said we will provide an updated report on the structural condition of the bridge. We are not providing an updated report on the structural condition of bridge. That is not in our contract and scope of services with the city. So there was um, information that we were hired to delist the bridge from the National Register of Historic Places. No, we were not hired to delist the bridge from the National Register of Historic Places. We are here to engage in a interactive and community engagement process to assist city leaders and staff and deciding a path forward with respect to the bridge. There is also information in the press that the city staff believes that demolition of the bridge is, for, is a foregone conclusion. That is false. They wouldn't have hired us if that was a foregone conclusion. We are here to engage in an objective process. We are here not to make a decision as impacts have a G, we are here to help your city council represent you and make a decision with respect to the bridge moving forward. And that's why I am thrilled to have all of you here today. So you should be commended on taking a, a chilly January night and showing up at a meeting like this. So this is, this is great. Um, so specifically, the project objectives as we move forward um, are to determine a proposed future. This is gonna to continue to be a proposed future for the existing Cascade Bridge structure and crossing. It's gonna be based on public input, stakeholder input, city staff input, um, prioritization of other infrastructure projects and funding at the city level, um, the availability of, of funding to implement either demolition or future use alternatives. It's gonna be based on, the proposed future will be based on cultural resource considerations. Again, we have state law that governs cultural resources. We have federal law, section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act, section 4F of DOT Act of 1966, all that govern historic resources. Um, specifically, this, and, and, and I'll mention this in a slide, you are, are all well aware of that this is a National Register of Historic Places structure. It is on the National Register. So um, the proposed future of the bridge and structure and crossing will be based on purpose and need considerations. Do we need a crossing at this location? Do we need it? Is it necessary? Do we need a pedestrian crossing at this location? Yes. Do we need a vehicle crossing at this location? Yes. Yes. So th our, our objective will be to gather data that validates the purpose and need for putting a crossing at this location. And the reason we'll have to do that in part is because whatever we do here is not gonna be cheap. Bridges aren't cheap, bridges are expensive. The price of steel and concrete have risen 61% since the 2012 study that was done on the bridge. 61%, a little higher than the inflation index. So I'll try not to drag this on too long, but I wanted to give a good um, perspective on, on why we're doing this study and where we're headed with it. Um, Let's look at the schedule of activity. This is, these are some tasks we were contracted to do um, with the city. We were, we, one of our tasks was to, to complete the website of which you guys are now aware of. Um, review past inspections, evaluations, studies. You will find some of these actually on the website. You can, do, you can download the reports. You can look at them. You can scrutinize them. You can evaluate the data that, that's in there. Um, 
We were also tasked to engage the State Historic Preservation Office, the State Historical Society of Iowa. We call them the SHPO. And we were asked to do that informally. The SHPO doesn't get engaged in, in what I mentioned before, Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act, unless you have federal funding. So we did it informally. It is important that the SHPO understand what the city is doing relative to that bridge and the direction they're going. They need to be engaged in the process, especially given the fact that we may have federal funding involved if we do anything with the bridge, rehab or otherwise. Um, so hold public, meet with stakeholders. We've done that, I'll, I'll show you some of the stakeholders we met with. Um, hold a public list, listening session, that's tonight. Um, compile the community, community input, best we can. Um, compile any additional data we received with respect to the purpose and need for a crossing at this location. Um, and then provide, we will be responsible for providing input to city staff as well as council. So and probably in a work session, we'll probably give them a formal presentation and report of our findings based on this effort. Any questions going forward? Or do I dare ask? <laughs> no. What does the word stakeholders mean? Stakeholders. So, um, stakeholders include um, community leaders. These stakeholders, the word means people that have a stake in the future crossing at this location, vehicle, pedestrian, historic, or otherwise. Um, and that are interested in the decision at hand. We're looking at Parks and Recreation Department. They may have a stake. Where, did, where does this bridge lead to? Two beautiful, beautiful parks, like, like very few cities have. Um, the Burlington Historic Preservation Commission, stakeholder. We met with them. Um, neighborhood residents, those neighbors that live right along Main Street um, that formerly experienced probably a higher level of traffic when the bridge was open. Um, local organizations, we in some of our meetings we've had business people speak up and say my tra traffic is down past my business because the bridge isn't there. Another business is saying traffic is increased because of the bridge isn't there. So um, all those people are stakeholders. The flow of traffic past their business affects the viability of their business. Friends of Cascade Bridge. There's a group out there that is, a, that is very strong um, promoter of historic <laughs> preservation and saving this bridge for what it is, a National Register, Register of Historic Places Structure, um, and uh, others. So does that help, sir? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, a little, little bit of history. Again, I think I'm preaching to the choir here, but um, the bridge was completed in 1896 at a cost of $16,000 back then. If you apply infl standard inflation rate, that only repre that represents less than $500,000 in, in 2019 dollars. Can you believe that? Um, so they were very, obviously it was, you know, back then it was a very cost effective structure to, to, to build at the time for, for the need that they had. Um, it was listed on the National Register of Historic Places on June 5th, 1998. So um, it's been on the register for quite some time, but it was only 10 years later that it was closed to vehicle traffic. And that was a result of inspections on the bridge um, that had concern about weight loads on the bridge. Um, it was closed to foot traffic in 2019. Um, and I, as I understand that, again, it was due to continued deterioration, um, as well as some concern about the amount of foot traffic that could be on the bridge at one time. So if the bridge could be loaded up with a thousand people because of its size, what does that weight represent on that bridge? 
realizing that one person crossing the bridge that weighs 200 pounds may not be a concern, but when we have a thousand people on the bridge associated with an event in the park or with rag bribe or something like that, um, all of a sudden that load becomes a concern relative to the condition of the supporting structure. The bridge has over a century of use. It is a landmark. So some of our outreach efforts to date have been with the Greater Burlington business leaders. Um, they were putting on a conference and we presented to them to, to make them aware of the study, of the process, and to get the input of business leaders. We also spoke directly to the Historic Preservation Commission, who as you might expect, gave some pretty pointed comments. Um, Burlington, more than any other city I work in, has a strong historic context. Many of that surrounding architecture of buildings, um, given it's a size. I work in many cities up and down the river, Muscatine, Bur Muscatine, Keokuk, um, Clinton, and the downtown here, from an historic perspective, is phenomenal. Um, so we talked to Preservation Commission and received some input from them on their perspective on the bridge. We talked to the Kiwanis. That was a really good show at the Kiwanis in terms of number of people that attended that event. So we got the word out to a lot of folks there. So some of you may have heard parts of this presentation before because I'm using parts that I presented to some of, in some of these outreach efforts. We spoke to the Rotary as well as to the young leadership group associated with the Greater Burlington Partnership, a, a very engaged young group, might I add. <clears throat> Let's talk a little bit about the history of this bridge with respect to repairs. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> the more serious repairs essentially began in about 1953. So you're, you're talking about, um, you know, roughly half a century after it was put into use. So uh, quite a bit of repairs in 53, but then you get to 1964, and that's when the steel roadway deck grading was installed. That steel, for those that don't know, I'm sure most of you know, the, the previous deck on that was wood. And as you saw in the postcard in one of the earlier slides, the bridge also supported a rail car, rail, actual rail tracks on it for a rail car. Um, the, there was a number of items. I'm not going to go through all these items, but these items are all in the reports that are on the website that you can download. I would also note um, that the bridge was clean and painted um, during about that 1984 time frame, okay? We did, um, as an environmental firm, we did go out and just take some random samples using what we call an XRF gun to see if that paint on the bridge might contain hazardous constituents like lead. Lead was a common component of both gasoline and paint back in the day. Um, Post-1978, it was eliminated from most of those products. So we took some random samples. We didn't sample the whole bridge, but just some random. And the, all of our sample, samples came up negative for lead-based paint, except for the yellow lines going down the middle of the bridge. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, I mean, in, in, in the point of that was to see, are we, the fact that we've got a number of samples come back negative shows us that the bridge was probably pretty much blasted clean at one time and repainted and there's very little lead-based paint uh, left on that structure. That affects, should, you, should we proceed to rehab, it does affect our rehabilitation cost. If we have to deal with lead-based paint, it is more expensive. Not a lot more expensive, but it's more expensive. Um, previous repairs in 1998, Removal of existing concrete foundation at Pier 3, replaced with new concrete grade beam and caissons cored into limestone bedrock and concrete abutment repairs. These 
the abutments as well as some of the piers are in pretty rough shape right now. For those that have walked underneath there and seen it, it's pretty evident. In that picture there, you can see some of the extensive rust that plagues the this, this structure. It's throughout the structure. Um, so the evaluations that we looked at, um, the previous repair plans were dated 1953, 64, 78, 84, and 1998. October 2006, there was a major bridge inspection um, that was completed. The bridge was rated in poor or critical condition at that time in 2006. So we are a long time from 2006. The superstructure was reduced from seven to three, which is not good. Um, the bridge at that time, and this is interesting, the bridge only supported 1,364 vehicles per day. That isn't a very high vehicle count. Okay, to give you a perspective on it, again, you think 1,000 vehicles a day, wow, that's a lot of vehicles going across that bridge. But we have to put everything into context these days. So 1,364 vehicles per day, um, the recent bridge that was replaced, um, Mount Pleasant, had closer to 5,000 vehicles per day, some, somewhere around there. So you can see why the necessity to fix that bridge was high. That's, a lot, that's five times the vehicle traffic that we're having on this bridge. Okay. The operating, the operating rating um, at the bridge in the, during 2006 study was um, for a type three vehicle about six tons. So in 2012, the city delved into a much deeper study focused on rehabbing the bridge. What was it gonna take to rehab this bridge? And this was done by Chuck Britson. This, they are an engineering firm and they have very qualified people, professional engineers in the state of Iowa. Um, and the purpose of that evaluation was rehabilitation, to understand it, to understand what it was gonna take and what those costs were. That study is also available on the website. Chuck Britson did go into detail on net present value, which takes into account future costs for maintenance and repair on that bridge as well. And they compared it to similar costs for a new bridge. So again, interest, some interesting data in that study. The structure was still in poor critical condition. Um, the superstructure was, was, was still at three. Um, they noted we had significant deterioration, significant section loss, cracking, and other deficiencies with a load rating of four tons. That load rating was based on one span that had the lowest rating of all the spans. It was the limiting factor of the bridge, thus, four tons. The other spans had higher ratings, but obviously when you cross a bridge, the lowest rating is going to be your limiting factor. They estimated a rehab construction cost of 6.1 million. Um, that was just construction costs, did not include design fees, um, did not include construction inspection. And if you were to rehab it, it would have a 20 ton weight limit and be a 50 year life structure. Okay. Um, in addition, the bridge obviously needs painting. Um, the rehab painting cost was at 1.6 million. So what I've done is, is I've taken it and I simply applied um, consumer price index inflation numbers to come up with what would that, this was, this was 2012. So eight years ago, not only that, a lot of their information was based on the 20, 2008 inspection that was done. So again, you know, not, there hasn't been any active investment that I'm aware of since this time on the bridge. So we are, are looking at probably continued deterioration, continued rusting, uh, pitting of the steel, etc. But if you simply apply inflation and you consider construction painting and design and inspection services by an engineering firm 
We are close to $10 million to rehab this structure today. For a 20 ton weight limit for a 50 year life. And associated with that will be two year ins two inspections every two years into perpetuity to make sure the structure is safe. Those inspections will run about anywhere, we've gotten estimates anywhere from forty to seventy thousand dollars. We're using a forty thousand dollar number for, for looking at uh, fractured critical areas on it. Um, so forty thousand dollars every two years. Some of those inspection costs, thank God, recently have come down just due to new technology, drone technology and otherwise. So it makes it a little easier to get up there and actually see parts of the bridge without get, getting a big lift down there and trying to get up to where you're looking at. So technology might be able to reduce it some, but for estimation purposes, I, it's important to know that if we rehab this, there is some operational cost associated with it. When you do inspections and you find things wrong with it, what do you have to do? You have to fix it. So there's, there may be repairs along the way during that 50 year life. So, so this is just some context on rehab. Um, give me an example cost for a new bridge. Let's look at the one that was just completed. We drove, I drove by it on the way in here. Beautiful structure, well done, awesome bridge. Um, Mount Pleasant, it's 500 feet long. Cascade Bridge is 450 feet long. It's a concrete, has concrete piers, beams, deck. Cascade will likely need a steel beam because one of the spans is 200 feet. Um, either that or we've got to rethink pier, pier placement on it. So, um, but overall the bridges aren't that a whole lot different in terms of, of span. Construction cost on Mount Pleasant was 4.3 million um, for a total cost of five million, probably just over that, I'm guessing, with inspection, but you got design, inspection, and construction. So we're generally around five million dollars for Cascade Bridge. So for those that aren't involved with this type of projects on a regular basis, it gives you some perspective on what it costs to replace a bridge these days. Um, other cost factors that could play into Cascade Bridge is okay, if we're gonna do something with this bridge, whether we rehab it, whether we demo it, we're gonna have to, if we have outside funds, federal funds, we're gonna have to go to the State Historic Preservation Office and consult with them and get their opinion on things we need to do to mitigate any adverse effects that they think we're causing to the bridge. It's part of the process when you use federal funds. So there could be additional mitigation, we call it mitigation cost associated with that. Um, if we want to do in a new bridge, if we want to put in more aesthetic or unique fe features or tie some sort of um, architectural, architectural features similar to Cascade Bridge into this bridge, it might cost, might cost us more to do that if we choose to do that. Um, additional width for, uh, of the structure for pedestrian use. Obviously, if you build a, a, a vehicle bridge here, you're going to want to build it for pedestrian use when you have, again, those beautiful parks right across the, the, the gully, the gorge, if you will. So, and from the input that, that I've gotten so far, um, back when the bridge was open for pedestrian use, when you could cross it, it was highly used. And people really enjoyed using that bridge, whether it was walking their dog, taking their bike, um, or just, you know, just as a, as a way to access the park from that direction. So. Um, from a pedestrian standpoint, it did sound like it got fairly good use when it was just open for pedestrians. Example, cost, bridge rehab. This was a bridge in Waverly, Iowa. They called it the Green Bridge. Went through a similar process that we're going through here with Cascade Bridge. Um, it isn't as long. It's not as complex. It has a structure above versus below. The above structure, from my observation, was not as near as deteriorated as Cascade's below structure. And so what's happened on Cascade, if you think about it, is obviously that structure down below catches any snow, rain, salt that is put on it. 
especially if there's salt for ice in the winter, that type of thing, it's going to catch all that below. Whereas this above, uh, above the deck structure won't, won't be affected by, those, by the salt. Um, and so you get less deterioration. But the point being is this was a historic bridge. There was strong impetus to try to um, save this in Waverly. They looked at numerous options. Um, if you were to scale the cost of, of rehabbing Cascade Bridge based on what it costs to rehab this bridge at 2.4 million, if you scale it to size and condition, you're looking at about 6.7 million is what we came up with. So we are trying to gain some perspective on the, the accuracy of, of the figure of, of rehabbing the bridge, which Right now, as you saw, based on my inflation adjusted number, was close to 10 million. So, th so we were we'd be looking at it, this is saying about 6.7 million. Again, we won't know details until formal engineering design commences and the engineers provide a probable estimate of construction con construction cost. So, but it has been done. Um, they rehab Green Bridge. It's operational. Um, they did look at. Um, and I, I, somewhere in here I have a picture of it. They did look at a pedestrian option here, um, actually replacing it. Um, that did not move forward. Uh, the community felt that they wanted to, to spend the money to rehab the bridge. <coughs> um, let's talk about prioritization, right? Um, we have in this community a lot of infrastructure to maintain for what I consider not a lot of population. We've got roughly 26,000 people in Burlington, and we've got a historic town, an older river town, a beautiful older river town that has a lot of older infrastructure as well. It is a lot to maintain that infrastructure. So some of the budget items that the city deals with include sewer, storm, stormwater, a sewer, parks. You have over 200 acres of parks in this community. It's phenomenal. You know, it bodes well for the other work I'm doing associated with downtown redevelopment. If we can get people to move downtown, I can tell you they will move down here to Burlington and live downtown when they know they have access to recreational venues and parks, especially some of the millennial generation or even empty nesters like myself. Um, so um, we've got over 200 acres. We've got pool. Pools are expensive. They're generally a drain on the budget. Facilities, city hall, public works, the auditorium, parking facilities. We've got trails. We've got a growing network of trails here. Trails are important for quality of life in a community. Um, we've got other programs. We've got a, golf, a municipal golf course. Um, rec center I believe other infrastructure flood walls we're trying to protect the community from flooding how long were we above flood stage last year 100 days 100 100 days, 100 days. No, 100 in the spring yeah it was more than that. it was a lot it was we were we were at above flood stage from for <laughs> what I consider most of the year um, you know, we had some, some couple months in the summer where it dropped down below flood stage for a little bit, and we're below now. Um, but again, that flood wall and that infrastructure is expensive. The city has to prioritize um, all these items. You know, we've got, in addition, we've got repair and reconstruction budgets, annual street maintenance budgets, all of which are drawing on, on tax revenue to get those things done. Burlington has one of the top 10 consolidated tax rates in Iowa for cities with a population over 25,000. Can, can all you see what your rank is there? It says you're number six. So, and that isn't, that isn't necessarily a function of, of, of necessarily poor management, it's a function of changing economic times, it's a function of population, um, and you, you, you have an older community with extensive infrastructure to maintain. 
So there has to be a tax base to support it. So your levy rate is combined with other costs, school levy rates and others, you, you have a fairly high tax rate. Why am I telling you this? What you already know, right? What you see every year. What you see on your property tax bills. Why am I telling you this? Because when it comes to looking at a project like this with respect to Cascade Bridge and the cost associated with rehabbing this structure, the cost associated with building a new structure, the cost associated with putting a pedestrian bridge in place there without doing anything with the existing bridge. All of these options have financial implications which affect your tax bill, the levy rate in this community, right? So again, I, I, I give this from perspective. We may, want, we may as a community say, this bridge is iconic. It has to be preserved and we're willing to invest $10 million to do it. If that's the case, it's important that we understand it has implications on our levy rate. We will bond to fund whatever we can't get from other state or federal incentives, and that will affect the levy rate. So that's just some, some perspective on, you know, we've got a lot going on here in Burlington. There's a lot going on in the next five years here in Burlington from what I've seen in terms of major projects. So, um, so with that, we've got a number of alternatives to consider. These are alternatives for you to consider. This is your bridge. This is your community. You're the one that pays the taxes. So we've got a lot of alternatives to consider. Rehab the existing structure for a 50 year life. Rehab the existing bridge for just pedestrian use. This is an interesting alternative. <clears throat> and the reason I say it's interesting, because if you rehab for this alternative, the cost to rehab are the same as if you do it for vehicle use. When you look at meeting the engineering standards for rehab for pedestrian, you're gonna end up rehabbing it at the same level you would for vehicle use. The difference is, if you just do pedestrians, your operational costs are gonna be less there are less bridge inspection requirements for a pedestrian bridge, and the cost is generally less as well. So from every, you got $10,000 in inspection cost every four years versus 40,000 or more cost every two years for a vehicle bridge. So your long-term operational cost associated with rehabbing this bridge for pedestrian use would be less. So interesting alternative. Um, remove the bridge, and do nothing. Even that's gonna cost you money. About a quarter million dollars more just to get that bridge removed and do nothing. And what's the risk? Not done. The risk of, there's a, we're taking a quick question here from this guy up front. He has the floor. So, what is the risk of doing nothing? Collapse. I know what the answer is. So, the risk of doing nothing, in, you know, in the case of this particular structure, is we have a road beneath it. We have. Um, someone help me out. What's that? Cascade Lane. Well, what's the sewer line that runs underneath there that's, that everyone uses as a trail? Um, yeah, the, the sewer interceptor is underneath that. So, I mean, we've got some things underneath this bridge. We've got use that occurs underneath this bridge. We've got a road underneath, it, underneath this bridge. Leaving it in place and doing nothing and letting it fall down is really not an option. And based on the engineering, the type of structure that this is, if one portion of this bridge fails, the rest of the bridge will fail, okay? And I think we have an, a science teacher in this audience that'll back me on that, right? Okay. All right. <laughs> so, um, so it, I, you know, it's an interesting thing, and what I've seen with the counties who have historic bridges, some of them have been left in place, they did nothing, and they built right next to it. And I have a picture that I'll show here shortly. The, um, but those bridges left in place, they end up becoming a nuisance. They end up kicking the can down the road. Someone else has to deal with it. And with the floods we had last year, the counties were in a world of hurt because a lot of those bridges collapsed. Some ended up in rivers. I lost one right by my house, um, right, into, right into the creek. We had no crossing on our county road. <laughs> so, but it was, it was a 100-year-old bridge. Um, 
you know? So, um, so if we pursue no further action, then no further action is actually gonna be no for, remove the bridge and no further action, as opposed to no further action whatsoever, meaning the bridge stays in place and it deteriorates, okay? Um, we could remove the bridge and install a trail up and down the ravine. You know, we could extend the trail system up and down the ravine, so there would be a way to get across over to the parks. Obviously, it's gonna have switchbacks. It's a pretty steep ravine, um, but it could be done. It could be engineered. Um, that is gonna cost anywhere from $250,000 to $750,000. 250000 for removal of the bridge, another half a million to um, design and install a trail system. So the picture you see there is actually a conceptual picture that they came up for the Green Bridge, bridge in Waverly. This is a pedestrian bridge, conceptual. Um, one of the alternatives they looked at uh, when they associated with removing the bridge in Waverly and putting a pedestrian crossing. So the picture you see in, in this slide, if you look to the right, you see a brand new bridge. You look to the left, you see an old historic bridge. This is a county bridge in Buchanan County that they left in place. The, the bridge on the left, you can't get on it, uh, or you're not supposed to get on it. Um, it um, <laughs> It's, it's subject to being knocked down by ice, those, those columns that you see that are supporting it, but the county didn't have the money to deal with it as an historic resource. Buchanan County doesn't have a lot of money. They don't have a lot of tax revenues. Um, so it got left in place. They had federal money to assist, uh, state and federal money to assist building the new bridge over the Wapsipinicon River, and they constructed the new bridge. The other's still sitting there just like that. So back to all our alternatives. We have more alternatives than the four I just mentioned. We can remove the bridge or replace with a new bridge for pedestrian traffic. So that would be what, what, like what they looked at in Waverly. Um, over $2 million, anywhere from 2.25 to 3.25. We could remove the bridge and replace it with a new bridge for vehicles and pedestrians and have a 100 year life. That would be three to five million dollars. Not that different from Mount Pleasant, okay? So again, that number is looking about half for vehicle or pedestrian rehab of the existing structure with a hundred year life, with likely less inspection and repair cost. I'm giving you financial information now. This is not related to the historic context or the nostalgia context of the bridge. I'm simply giving you financials so you can understand the financial implications of implementing various alternatives as we move forward. We could do nothing with the existing bridge and build a new pedestrian or bike, a bike bridge right next to it. So we could just leave it there, maybe get some money later to help keep it uh, as a historic structure and keep it from falling down. Um, but that, that parallel pedestrian bridge would run two to three million, plus any cost to keep the bridge from falling down if we leave it there. So we've got a lot of alternatives to consider here. And these alternatives will be presented to you in that hard copy survey. This is a grid of what that looks like. You all should have got, or some of you, we had a little more people than we expected. Most of you should have got this. If not, we've got some more of this table up here that talks about those alternatives. Please pick one up. It's not that easy to grasp what's in this table because it has a lot of variables in it. You need to study it in order to understand it. Um, I don't expect you to take a look at this and be able to comprehend all this information right off the bat. But this is what we've come up with as potential alternatives moving forward. This is what your city leaders need to decide on from a proposed future crossing or action associated with the bridge. Website, again, I'm happy to do whatever we wanna do with that in terms of putting more information on it, other relevant information that you see, I can update that at any time. I like to try to keep it updated with the comments too 
I have comments on there that I've received via the website. You can go on there and read those comments. They are in a separate page on the website. Um, you can get a flavor for some of the comments that have come in via the input page on the website. I am um, a little behind. I've got two comments that I've got just the last couple days that aren't, aren't posted on there yet. But otherwise, you can read the comments. I don't state who they're from, but I put just the verbiage on there. So that picture there was, I, I, was, I was out taking a look at the bridge and walking the parks, getting a feel for the area. And I noticed that the railing had been smashed since the last time I was there. So it's things like this that affect maintenance costs down the road. Um, apparently, a tree branch fell on it. Um, so we are going to, um, we're going to do comment period. Okay. Um, so, so with that, I'm going to go back to, I'm going to leave up that alternative matrix if that is okay. Um, <coughs> So I'd like to collect any um, comment cards that people wrote comments or questions on at this time. Um, um, Brandon, Rachel, do you have any cards that I could? start with so what we're going to do now is you know feel free what I what I guess I what I'd like to first do is let's just take some questions right out of, out of the audience or comments and preferably I'd like some constructive ideas on the path forward if there are any um, and Nick can you hit the lights please the one on the left there you go Thank you. so um, who's got a question up, up here in front or comment. Okay. Yeah. First of all, um, I was there the night 2012 in, in, at the city council when the city made a decision. Because originally, what happened was internal staff made a decision that the bridge wasn't safe. So then there was like $48,000 spent to come in and look at by an engineering firm that builds bridges and say, hey, what do you think about this bridge? 2012, very clear, poor critical, as you shared here. The big thing that you didn't share was there was a comment that was in the class, in that, by that engineering firm that clearly said, this bridge in its existing state cannot handle its own weight because of the deterioration Right. of the pivot points of those one point okay. Okay. that the bridge would collapse. So that's, I made a comment that night because one of the city council members asked me, Mr. Smith, are you willing to pay more taxes? I live on 2807. So, the, so let me, just so that people are back in here, the comment that I'm hearing up here is there's a, there's a reference to an old council meeting. There's a reference to the fact that the, the report clearly stated that the bridge can't support its own weight in its existing condition exactly. in the report. And, and we'll never forget is the decision was to make the decision, I challenged the, the city council, so you, what you've heard tonight, you're going to close the bridge, correct? And they talked about it a little bit, and I said, no, wait a minute. You just paid $48,000 for an engineering firm to walk in here, tell you it's not safe, it's not, can't support itself. Who carries the liability if something, if that bridge collapses with one person walking on it? But the other question that was addressed to them the next morning was, that, that road is used to get to Cascade Landing. So it's just as dangerous today as it was 12 years ago to go underneath there. So the, the comment is the bridge in its existing state uh, represents a potential liability. We understand that. There is risk associated with it in leaving it in its existing state. There's a road underneath it, which I mentioned in the presentation, that is used to get to Cascade Landing. Um, so if the bridge were to fall, again, represents liability. Now creates the real issue. 
nothing's been done. So the liability, I assume, falls onto the city. It's our new mayor here. <laughs> falls onto the city if something would happen between now and the time the bridge comes down. That's a liability risk that we have out there. With documented money we paid for to say that bridge isn't safe. But the, what everybody and what you haven't mentioned here, where the real safety issue is that's going on right now, because I have a, lived here along with this, and there's a lot of other members that live on this in the city, is that bridge, that road through the park is to not, not designed to handle the traffic. And so we have an ongoing maintenance that is created there, but more important, there's a hell of a safety issue going on when we have the little leagues out there and stuff like that, because you have all this traffic. When the traffic is going across. Through so the there. comment is, is that there is a safety risk associated with traffic going through the park, as well as a higher maintenance issue associated with traffic going through the park when the bridge is in place. Is that what your comment is? When the bridge is in place, or if the, they remove the bridge, because okay. there still has to be a plane if you just remove the bridge, which I'm all for. It, I mean, it, there's a huge liability so, that we all have. Miss, and your name so, is Smith. Yeah. Mr. Smith says he's for removing the bridge. So, my, but my point is, until there's a decision to open up that traffic, then there has to be an engineering study or whatever, whatever you all need to do to relate the sit to the city on how we're going to make those kids safe that are in that park with all the activities that right. we're doing in the summertime right. that would not have all that traffic. Right. And now they do. Right. And so the so park, do we wait for somebody to get hurt? No. Or do we attach it? Or do we or we take care of it now? Well, we've done a damn good job putting it up for how many years now? Right. It's so been the last eight years. It is. So it is time to address the bridge. The city is addressing the bridge. The issue is, is that we do have a potential from Mr. Smith's perspective is that we have a potential safety issue associated with traffic in the park for all the various activities, especially when there are children involved in some of those activities in the park. So, good comment. Thank you, sir. Right here. Yeah, I mean, and I agree with the safety concerns, but if you're so concerned about safety the kids, that wreck place shouldn't be where it's at, not in an industrial park. So that should be removed right off the bat. We're talking about things like that. And those we'll safe things can be controlled. You know, you got to watch yourself. You got to be a little bit. Parents got to be. Kids got to be a little bit. You can't protect, protect everybody from everything. Right. So right. why are you building a red flex in an industrial park that traffic running through it all the time? Right. So this is. Uh, and I'm not against safety. I'm right. all for safety. So they can, that, you can't. You can't just bring it up to suit your own. Ideas or your perspective. So the the comment is is that the 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 rec 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 plex is in an industrial park and probably some concern about the siting of there relative to safety and that all risk cannot be mitigated. Are you talking about the rec plex in so, West Burlington? Yes. Is that he's talking about pardon? He's talking about the park. Dang, dang. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Dank Park. Park. You said industrial park. In the pool is out there. Yeah. The pool yeah. and the ball park. So, so, <laughs> you're talking West Burlington? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, okay. agree. So, there's, there's other concerns about siting of facilities in the city. So, I'm going to down for the record. So, thank you, sir. Um, back here. Are there any additional land costs? involved in a new bridge? There could be additional land costs if it's not on present alignment. And we need more right away. Did you, did you get that? Yeah. So if, if, it, if a new bridge is on the current alignment and it's city right away, we will not have any additional land costs. Uh huh. Based on my numbers, how many bids? $10,000 to rehabilitate it. How many people came forward and said it's $10 million? If it's $5 million to build a new bridge? It hasn't gone out. The, the, this has not gone out for bid. These are engineering cost estimates. There, there is no bid process that's been engaged at this point. So good comment. So thank you. Next. I would like to know, uh, 
other than the tax money. Like if the, if we preserve the old one, are there any funds that can people can use? Yep. Like grants, like you say you have downtown, can we get a big grant to help with that? So the question is, let me make sure I'm getting this right. The, the question is, are, are there funding mechanisms to yes. replace or to rehab? To rehab. To rehab. In addition to the taxes. I realize yes. the so, taxes are That's a great question. Away, but can one get a big grant like right. you do downtown? So like the tiger grant downtown. Uh -huh. Right. So that's a great question. Um, there are funding mechanisms out there. They're competitive. We can get we we can get funding. You know the intent would be to go after funding for rehab. That's a big thing. And maybe even if you do have okay. people, maybe we even are willing to pay right. fifty yeah. cents every so, time we go full. So, you know. I mean, there's a high probability that you would get a million dollars uh, for rehab. Um, you know, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, so that's a great question is the, the opportunity to look at alternative sources of funds will not be ignored. Um, it is not a, obviously what you've seen with the city and the work they've done related to the flood wall, related to um, sewer improvements, related to um, what's going on with some of the streetscaping improvements and so forth associated with the Tiger Grant the city in cooperation and assistance by Southeast Iowa Regional Planning Commission will seek whatever funding they can get to assist with this project. We need to get Charlie Nichols back. <laughs> Question back there. Yes, will your firm be involved with the project, whatever choice we made to be in these like now to the end? Our firm, what is yeah. your charge for doing this? Yeah, our, our, our rates are similar to what other professional service firms are. So we have a rate schedule that the city has. Um, and so the, it's a it's a valid question. Would our firm be involved in, in post work? That is up to the city. We would only be involved to the extent that the city would select us for the purpose of doing environmental services, not engineering um, or anything like that. So it would be National Environmental Policy Act work associated with federal funding, Cultural Resource Act, Section 106, consultation <coughs> assistance, memorandum of agreement with SHPO related to um, any adverse effects? So, a good question. Not a guarantee that we'll be involved. I can't guarantee that. I understand your, your, your um, charge is competitive, but what's that the number? Right, it varies by different staff. So, um, we're happy to send your rates. How much did you get paid to do this project from the city? So, this, this project has a, has a city contract of approximately $47,000. That contract entails not just public engagement, not just development of website. This project entails um, the interaction with the City Historic Preservation Office, and it involves an MOA. Should we pre-negotiation of an MOA condition? Should there be an adverse effect? Oh, I'm sorry. Memorandum of agreement. Your question. I apologize. Uh, a memorandum of agreement that tackles. That tackles mm. adverse effects. Whether well, there could be adverse effects associated with three happenings, then the ship will set the adverse effects relative to its national origin nomination. So if that's the case, the city will negotiate a memorandum agreement to mitigate those effects. Our firm is contract and part of this contract to facilitate the Is those words really meaning your firm your firm will help delist this? No. means that if there are adverse effects to the bridge associated with, with rehabilitation, it could still be on national register. We will assist with ship of consultation. Uh, everybody talks about raising taxes to fix the bridge. What about opening it up to investors with municipal bonds? That's probably a question I can't answer. It's a, it's a good comment. Um, so. I, I, I had a question like this come about at one of the sessions, the outreach sessions, and... and let me ask this first. Is five, would $5 million be a large municipal bond? I see other municipal bonds in Iowa. 
that are generally in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. I don't see anything with a $5 million price tag. So I guess that's the first thing I wonder. And if that is something that is feasible, could that be something that could possibly happen? It would probably move to Burlington beyond their bonding capacity. So, so, so your initial question, though, was private investors right. utilizing municipal bonds? Was that your statement? Yeah, I mean, I purchased municipal bonds. Right. So could Burlington issue a municipal bond that could be purchased it, for the next? They, they could issue one, but it's still, it's still going to affect their rating and their bonding capacity. Right. Um, it could be, could be done, but, you know, again, is it, is it an advantageous to go through that process versus any other process? I don't know. I, I'm not I'm not a municipal finance ex expert. I can't I can't probably answer your question. I'm thinking, I, I hear a lot of people complain that taxes would go up if we did something to the bridge. People who are against rehabbing or replacing the bridge because their taxes would go up. I just see that as another option that should maybe be explored. Good comment. Good comment. Um, so what would the time period be for the bridge to be built? A new bridge. The time the time frame. Let's see, yes. how long would it take? Months, years? Years. And the reason I say that is if we engage federal money in this process, that means you will engage in the Section 106 process. You will engage in a formal 4F statement because a new bridge on the existing line would, alignment would mean removal of the existing bridge, which the SHPO would consider an adverse effect. And Brandon, you can correct me if I speak out of turn. <laughs> and SHPO stands for? State yes. Historic yes. Preservation Office. Oh, okay. yeah. right. So federal money means we have to consult with our State Historic Preservation Office. They will determine whether it's an adverse effect. It will be an adverse effect, correct, Brandon? If you take up the bridge, it's an adverse effect. It's an adverse effect. Well, it's going to fall down anyway, so <laughs> would that be adverse? That, that would be adverse. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good point. If it, if it falls down, it's an adverse effect. You know, we don't want it to fall down. Um, but, mm -hmm. you know, so the, the process, therefore, back to your question, what is the duration to get a new bridge? I could tell you to get through the environmental planning process based on my years of experience with DOT and Federal Highway Administration is going on uh, this particular process for a new bridge is gonna run you at least two years. Because of 4F issues, because of Section 106 consultation, because the National Environmental Policy Act process at, a, at, an, at an environmental assessment level. That's assuming that there aren't significant impacts that jump it up to an EIS level, environmental impact statement level. There are, so, so just real quick, there are various levels of environmental studies that will have to be done. Um, for those of you that, that are following what, what Trump administration is doing right now, he's trying to uh, lessen some of that process, especially as, a, as it relates to coal and gas. Um, because the process is long. So, my, my, in answer to your question, the National Environmental Policy Act process at an environmental assessment level, meaning we're, we're, we're evaluating everything. We're evaluating the gorge, the, the plants, the, it, the, the stream that runs through there, all that gets evaluated, the future air, uh, air emissions from cars that are gonna use the bridge, the future traffic projections, all that stuff goes into to the environmental assessment. And erosion and the erosion, uh, stormwater control, all that goes in there. So you look at those impacts. That process with the DOT and Federal Highway Administration will take some time. So we'll say two years. Two years. Good. Okay. So if you started that process today, we wouldn't even start building a bridge till 2020. So once that process is done, you've only made it through likely 10% design or preliminary, you know, early stages, maybe 30% preliminary design right. from an engineering standpoint, which means once that process is done, you've got to go through the, the formal design process of developing plans and specifications for a new bridge. That design process is going to take you another six months, um, probably. A year. So you wouldn't even start until 23. So by the time you take it out to bid for construction and a construction crew gets on it, we're, you're, you're, you're probably not that far off, three, four years. Okay, so couldn't we raise the money locally somehow? So, and not go through the process? No, so, go through the process. Oh, I see what you're saying. But have, like they built the yeah. library for 11 million, right? That was my question I oh, have written yeah. up there. So, that, so for you in the back that can't hear, the, the question is, we're trying to get to the root of how long is it gonna take to build a new bridge and there cost, if, okay. if we do it? What are those costs going to be? And could we do it locally? Could we 
raise the funds privately, like privately to make it happen. Building. Yeah. Um, Would Des Moines County kick in on it? Now, um, so, so I, I don't know if you could raise the funds privately. Well, let's assume you did. I mean, that's fine. If you still have that federal involvement in addition to your funds, Couldn't the city is going to manage that federal involvement process. The time frame isn't going to change. Um, so what percentage could we get of the five million for uh, from the federal funds? Oh, Nick would probably know better than I would, but probably a million, a million on the new bridge, or could we get a build? Uh, we have a chance to get a build grant, but the build grant are about five percent win win rate. So build grant is the new infrastructure funding tool that uh, communities go after to try to obtain money for for projects like this. That would be good. With so. Uh, there, there is a grant mechanism where we can apply for funding, and maybe we would get 50% of the cost. We're probably not going to get over 50% of the cost. So, if we got. But if you go out that four years, then what the increase in the cost? So, yeah, the cost will increase over time. Um, yeah, well, probably with inflation or with well, uh, just, and steel tariffs. Just uh, right. take the. You can figure that out. Probably there wasn't, but right. Good, good question, though. This is good thought process related to how how can we accomplish a structure here um, if we were not to fund it entirely with city funds. So, and what is the time frame of getting a structure in place if we have to go through federal involvement on this process? And then, how many years would it take to build? No. Mount Pleasant took one construction season. In that one year. So. Um, yeah, that was pretty fast. So you would actually be driving across the bridge. Let's just be conservative and say five years. Yeah. Good. If all goes well. Sounds great. If all goes well. Let's do it. Okay. <laughs> back and back again. I just want to introduce myself. My name is Terry Ariano, and myself and Lisa Walsh are co-chairs of Friends of Cascade Bridge. So we have signed a contract with Working Bridges that is a not-for-profit organization that is run by engineers and other specialists that look at rehabilitation and have rehabilitated bridges similar to this. They were there today. We have spoke with the company that has painted in the past. We've talked to other engineers, and they are producing a report. I can tell you from what I see, it's a fraction of the quote that is coming out here for um, rehabilitating it because we're talking about people who have a passion with rehabilitation that are not for profit. Now, they will have that report to us, and we are having a public meeting at FM Bank next Thursday so that they can present their report and their findings on what it would cost to rehabilitate it. So if anyone's interested, I do have flyers. It's open to the public. It's on the 6th at 6 o'clock in room 216 at the FNF Bank. That's great, that's great. Thank you. It should be valuable information. Yes. So I think. Um, it's good to see that kind of passion in the community. So, uh, sir, right here. For years, I thought rehabbing the bridge was the way to go because from a structural standpoint, what you see underneath the bridge is very interesting. Mm -hmm. I walk under the bridge frequently, but because of the costs and the issues associated with the old bridge, I think we need to proceed with a new bridge. But that's very involved. You've got city council, you've got city engineers, you've got fund and right engineering outfits. You need public input because uh, not long ago, a number of years ago, the city spent four hundred thousand dollars on a preliminary design for the bridge, and it was in, it was contrary to the Great River Road because. It, Way it, it, it curved into a Dankler Park. So the city needs to understand, the people need to understand the in depth effort it takes to effectively build a bridge out of the right materials that's going to be a long term bridge. And then the city needs to understand how to maintain it because the, the years since I've been here, since 2004, even 20 years before that, the bridge was not. Cascade Bridge is not maintained the way the city said it was supposed to be maintained. They didn't wash the salt of it off. So you know. let me capture a little bit of what you're saying to the rest of the audience, if I could. <clears throat> so the comment here is that um, the gentleman's former opinion was that the bridge should be rehabbed. 
in looking at some of the information, under, looking at this, the substructure and the, and the cost, which may be debunked by Terry's report when it comes in. Actually, um, it's not my report, it's called Working Bridges. I, yeah, right. So that cost, that cost may, maybe there's, maybe there's some methods or means or methods to reduce it. But let's just say that the professional engineers that came up with this cost are accurate for now, just for the purpose of argument, right? Um, your comment is, is that the cost that we're showing for rehab, you would rather see construction of a new bridge. Yes. And the second part of your comment was that the city staff need to be attentive to proper maintenance procedures, alignment, um, some of the effects that were mentioned by Mr. Smith with respect to how does this impact traffic in the park, how does this impact safety. So there's a whole gamut of other issues we need to pay attention to, is what you're, what I'm getting out of your comment. Is that correct? Right. right. Okay. Well, good comment. Good comment. Sir? Has there been any kind of a new survey in the last couple of years of people for refurbishing bridge versus building a new bridge with pedestrian in? I don't have anything. A large, I, large numbers of, you know, a general public area. You know, I could, I could probably reach out to the folks in Waverly and see if they have something along those lines. No, I mean, in Burlington, <coughs> for the Cascade Bridge. Oh, there, there's no, there's no, there's no broad survey that we've done right now. The only means that we've, we've done to provide some info right now is made the website accessible and try to get the word out. The word did go out in the city's Facebook page as well. Um, yeah, put it out there, so uh, to try to get people to comment back. But in terms of a survey, there's there's this. We are talking right now with city staff about doing that on a larger scale through a um, electronic means to get it out to the masses. Um, so well, that decision hasn't been made. But that's a good comment. You know, really, you know, part of this process and the challenge with what we're trying to do here is to get a representative sample from the community and, and some consensus from the community on, on what is the direction forward. And we have some you know, strong, passionate preservations in the community. We have engineers in the community that think this is a, a great structure, and it is. It is the, as we understand it, it's the only structure of this type left in Iowa. <laughs> is that correct, Brandon? It's the only one listed on the National Register. Only one of this type listed on the National Register. So. Um, then there's the whole cost factor. There's nostalgia tied to this. There's a lot of people that use this bridge historically um, that it has some sentimental value to. Um, there's the economic factors that we're trying to weigh, which so far I haven't seen a strong, I haven't based on traffic numbers and, and direct economic benefit, I haven't seen a strong case for that related to the businesses that affects. It does affect some businesses. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, in, in terms of an overall community economic impact, I, I'm not seeing it. I do see it as having an indirect economic benefit from a redevelopment standpoint of the community, related specifically to downtown and attracting people to downtown. I think it is, um, you know, that there, there could be an indirect effect to have either some access to the park there associated with people that might go from downtown up Main Street. But in terms of direct business, I'm not seeing it. So we're looking at economic, we're looking at social issues, we're looking at environmental cultural issues, and we're looking at financial issues to come up with some consensus on what's, uh, what's, the, what's the best path forward here. So this is why you're here, and I'm glad you're all here, and I'm glad you're all passionate about this and providing some input. Um, I guess I do want to get on to having you complete this survey. Um, I will take this gentleman's one more comment here. Oh, yeah, it's just, just a comment. Uh, I got some other things I'll probably okay. leave on your website. But, you know, <laughs> most communities think they, they got uh, good ideas to be unique. Right. You know, and unique just means you have unique things. Right. Cascade Bridge is one of them. Right. Crable Park is another one. Correct. The road should run through Crable Park because it is kind of an arboretum, et cetera, et cetera. People don't even know that. They could probably have some new plantings out there. There's, there's okay. hundreds of trees out there which are... And there's a lot of deer out there. 
A lot of yeah. people, <laughs> a lot of people <laughs> here are reading in yeah. Burlington, but they know how the word is going to be saying. But you know, uniqueness means you've got to spend some money to be unique. Right. That's why you get to it. What so happened to us after World War II? We, we call that a sense of place. So, so this is an important comment. Does the bridge does and what the bridge provides access to Crapo Park and us provide a sense of place for the community of Burlington. Does it provide, does it make Burlington more of a destination? Yes. It's a, it's a very relevant question. It's very relevant to community planning and prioritization. It's very relevant to the future of Burlington and um, potential revitalization. So it's a good comment. Appreciate it. Okay. Okay. Well, we're gonna go. I'm, I'm gonna take. I'm gonna take one more here. You're with him, right? <laughs> okay. All right. I have a little bit different perspective, I think, on this. Um, I'm a real estate agent here in town, and when you have um, the hospital and different businesses recruiting quality people to come to town to take a job, we all like good doctors, right? For sure. You pick them up at the hospital and take them on a community tour. Right. And you start out from the hospital, come around, eventually get through the parks, and then you have to go through an area of town that isn't as pretty, you don't get to utilize the Riverview, the Riverview homes, and that kind of thing. And it can, I'm selling your community, folks. And but, I, there was a, but there was a brew pub over there I saw when I drove it today. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure I'm buying it. No, I mean, I mean, I mean, no. Yeah. Your comment is real relevant. So the comment is, if you were to show this town to someone as a real estate agent or some or otherwise, um, how does the, the existing structure as it is, or how would a new structure impact that person's perception of buying, buying real estate in this town? Right. Or a visitor that you're giving a tour of the town? Again, something I want you to think about. Please provide some comment when you're looking at these alternatives in the survey. Very relevant. It does get back to the gentleman's comments over here about developing a sense of place, developing a destination, what does Burlington mean, what is unique, why would people want to come here. So um, with that, I'm going to take one last, <laughs> one last question. Do you have a question? I do. Yeah, she has a question. I, I volunteered down at the historical site, and they have tour buses that go through the to visit our town. Yeah. And they have a number of places where they will take that tour bus around with the people in it. They don't go to the park because it's not the easy shot. It's not the view. It's it makes a difference. When Rag Fry was here, so they don't take they don't take them around on the on the no, through the other road. No, they no. don't. And when Rag Fry was here, and they had a ton of people staying out at the park, city so complained that they did not have people coming downtown. So the comment. So let me sort of try to summarize your comment real quick. <laughs> For the right everyone in the audience, I think the comment is that the the at, the lack of access across that bridge right now is a deterrent to showing off a good portion of Burlington that people actually are deterred from seeing Crapo Park and don't go into it because they don't have that easy access off of Main Street. That's true. Is that the comment? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Mine is basically a question. Years ago, there were metal plaques with the names of the aldermen and people on the council at the time the bridge was built. My great-grandfather's name was on that. It is since gone. It is either, I don't think anybody took it to preserve it, unfortunately. I checked with the parks. They have no record of anything. So are you looking for it? Are you trying somebody to somebody cut the bolts <laughs> in like, to, okay. to melt it down? Does nice. anybody know anything? I have a comment. So back in the back, what we're looking for is an original plaque that shows, that was on the bridge, that was since taken off, that shows who constructed it? Yes, it's on the front of your display, your very first page, that green yeah. plaque when you started your speech. Okay, that green plaque that was on the first page oh, so says 1896 on it. Um, that plaque apparently is missing. If anyone knows where it's at, um, please get with this. Well, the city or someone. <laughs> or the city or someone and, and let us know. Okay, Nick. I'm sure it's van. I'm sure it's vandalism. There were two, but there's only been one the last 10, 15 years. It's gone. 
on the southeast. Okay. Yeah. okay. One, let's try to get in one more question here, folks. Thank you. So the relevance of the bridge to your comment. So so what so how are you equating that to just mentioned that you mentioned that just local people and the right. Okay. People are coming here to see our parks. So the relevance of the bridge to those Okay, so accessibility. So we have about the comment is is that Crapo Park and those parks are notor are, are are basically destinations for people outside the community. Even in, in, in other countries are coming to see it. And that, that additional access is important relative to those people that are coming to see that destination. So, okay, with that, I'm going to allow you guys some time to, I, so first of all, I want to say thank you for the engagement. Thank you for the comments. Thank you for the questions. There is continued opportunity. There is um, obviously no decision in, in immediately, but there is opportunity on the website beyond this survey. So please complete this survey. Don't leave. We would like to pick them up before you leave. Um, so please complete those surveys. Thank you. Oh, you're going. Get your I've got to tell you about the survey.